We are presented by WinBet. Betting is a team sport. Bet together at WinBet. It is my pleasure to welcome Jets quarterbacks coach Rob Calabrese to the studio. Thanks for coming up. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You work basically just under our studio right now. What's it been like here in year two, the differences for you in your position? Um, it's, it's been great just to go from year one to year two and the expectation now with these guys knowing our scheme, especially year two with Zach, not a rookie anymore. And for myself as well, you know, getting with LaFleur first year, working with him and the guys on our staff. So it's been a great experience for me and um, I'm looking forward to see what we put on the field come Sundays. I want to get to your background, but first let's go back to late January, Mobile, Alabama, Rob Calabrese, <laughs> the offensive coordinator of the national team. What was that week like for you what did it mean and also how cool of an opportunity was it? it it was a huge opportunity for not only myself but our staff as far as an evaluation with each one of those prospects you know we took Jeremy Rucker from the senior bowl and we had him there and was able to coach him and watch him go on the field and take what we taught in the classroom and go execute but for myself just being able to coordinate that coordinate that game I was appreciative of coach Sala and the floor to let me do that and um on game day, it was amazing being able to call plays and just watch it unfold and, and try to execute the scheme. So uh, I was happy with how it turned out and um, great learning experience for myself. Well, you guys got the W. We did. Uh, Ron Middleton, head coach uh, during that game. How did you grade yourself in terms of self-scout afterwards? Uh, <laughs> not too much self-scout. You know, I had about uh, 100, 100 Reese's per day. So <laughs> that's not good. But other than that, it was uh, we were able to go out there and execute, and that's the most important thing. You have three days to, to practice, to install a scheme, to, to get a fair evaluation on these guys. Can they handle it? But also, can we execute and not and not have negative plays and, and things that pop up like that? So I was happy with, with what we did on the field and the, the players. They were awesome, and the coaching staff, like, we handled it well. How much did you throw at those guys in three days before they go out there? Because – Obviously, you want them to learn, but at the same time, you don't want to throw too much at them. Right, and you, you threw we threw a lot at them because you got to think of it with how college football is nowadays and, and the lack of huddling and verbiage. These guys signal a lot of things, so that's all new to them. And then to give them our offense and, and certain amount of plays and to be able to go execute, it's, a, it's overwhelming for them at first. And you, we had about a two-hour meeting the night before practice and then went right to the practice field, so... They had to crunch it all in. They had to put some time in and study on their own, which they did. And it uh, it just snowballed into that, and it was, it was a good week. I know you obviously going to become fans of a lot of these guys because you invest in them, and then you get to know their personalities a little bit. You guys end up taking some of these players who participated in the Senior Bowl down in Mobile, Alabama. But for you specifically, what kind of relationships did you start with Kenny Pickett from Pittsburgh, Desmond Ritter from Cincinnati, and then Carson Strong from Nevada, all guys who are now on NFL teams. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I got to uh, communicate with them a little bit before, a week before, because they were eager. They wanted the playbook and um, just started that process of building the relationship and just getting to meet those guys in person and spend that time with them. And them being quarterbacks, they spent a lot more time in the meeting rooms when they could. They extra and, and got there early in the mornings and to go over things. But it was a good group, and they're, they're dedicated. They're smart. That's the reason why they were there, and the reason why they have moved on in the NFL and have spot and have homes now. But uh, talk to them on draft day. Congratulate. Yeah, I was wondering them. that. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I, I communicate with them just throughout throughout this process because you, you know you built that relationship and you want to see these guys do well because you know I had a part in that of just showing them what the NFL is like and and watching them grow in those short three days. But um, have a good relationship with all three of them. Sala gets hired in January 2021. How soon after did you get a call? Oh, shoot. Maybe – I don't even know the time frame. Maybe a week or two after. Yeah. But uh, we were on break and, you know, kind of got word from my agent that this, this could be happening and was lucky enough to just talk to Sala on the phone and the floor and, and things worked out and I was able to come back home. What was the difference – the landscape right now that you're dealing with as opposed to last year um, because I wanted to ask you specifically specifically about one person who um, made such a lasting impact in the short time that was Greg Knapp because yeah. that was a guy you worked with a lot last spring. I was attached to his hip and um, first getting here that, that was <clears throat> that was probably the most important person I've met in my coaching career in that short amount of time and uh the amount of information and love and just knowledge that he just wanted to share because he was at that at that spot in his career where he was at peace with what he was doing and just wanted to help develop players, coaches, anybody possible. And uh, 
I learned so much from him in that short amount of time. And I was, I was so appreciative to just, to just be able to be in his presence. And um, I knew coming into this, this, that was the situation with how, what we were going to be in the quarterback room. And I was looking forward to it because of his experience and, and then getting to meet the type of guy he was. And it, it was just, it was huge for me. And just, I'm, I was very lucky and very blessed to just be around him. That's what everybody says about Napper. What did he bring to the table in terms of when he was on the field and in the classroom and why did guys gravitate towards him? It's just his energy. You'll, you'll feel his vibe as soon as you just, you got to meet him, you'll introduce, he went around the whole building the first day we got here. And I, that was the first thing I noticed is he's making an effort to go start that relationship and create that bond with whoever that he came into contact with. And those were things that I learned that I had just be, I was just a football coach. There's a ball and scheme and film and he had everything fit. with all that. He had everything else outside of that. And just he had like his vibe attracted people to him. People wanted to go talk to him because that's the type of person he was. Why was he so good with quarterbacks, though? Um, his energy, his enthusiasm, his meetings. You just knew you never knew what was going to happen. So you're always on your toes in a good way. And he just was he was an amazing teacher from his experiences, from his way to communicate what he wanted to get done in the classroom to the field. and. It was, it was really cool to be a part of. He tutored and mentored some of the all-time greats. Yep. During those meetings, would he pull up some clips? Of from course. Those oh yeah. 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 Can, can, can you well, talk about some of your experiences? We watched some of the Peyton Manning clips, yeah. and um, you know, he he uh, in his office he has his old playbook from um, Sacramento State, I believe, and I have it, and uh, just his notes, and just to be able to go through and look at those things from when he was a quarterback to when he was a coach, and it's just this giant playbook of information. I, I often look through it just to kind of just remind myself of his key coaching points and how he believes in the quarterback position offensively and and, and in total as a, as a person. There's there's so much good information in there. Can you talk about how difficult it was for you not to lose the man professionally who was going to mean so much to you, but him as a person? Because you're just talking about it right now, and I see it in your eyes, what he meant to you as a guy. Yeah, it was um, – it was probably one of the, the toughest phone calls that I had gotten out of the blue. And we were kind of getting ready to come back from training camp. And just to hear that happen to, to the type of man he was and, and what he meant to so many people, um, you know, just watching the, his ceremony on, on, uh, on the Internet when they had it and hearing those people talk about him and the stories they shared, it was it was kind of uh, – it was a surreal experience to just, you know, I felt that and then just to see everyone else and those important people and how many people he impacted in his life. And I was just so, so blessed to just sit there and say, I mean, how lucky am I just to spend those six months with him and be able to just be a sponge and soak everything up, but also just, you know, have a friend that, that cared so much about each, each individual he came into contact with. There's, there's our text messages and, you know, throughout summer break, he's mandatory send pictures to your family. I want to see what's going on. Send me a video. What you got going on? Keep me in a loop. See, he's sending pictures. So, those are things that you just you just you don't come into contact with much very often. And I was very lucky to to, to experience that. A unique individual. Everybody who came in contact with Greg Knapp would say that he was your friend, and he yes. would get to know your name, walk around the building, get to know your name, and come back to it. And then he know your family members. Oh, yeah. um, from a football perspective. How do you make the transition in terms of last year of what you guys are doing with the quarterbacks? Because it's you and your first year. Um, Greg Knapp was going to be instrumental throughout the season for you guys, but you have to make the transition. And Robert Sala said that you guys wouldn't be doing Napper any justice if you took sure. that step back because he wants you guys to live and embrace every moment. You hire Matt Cavanaugh and then at a certain point during the season after Zach Wilson's hurt with a knee injury, you bring in John Beck. Yeah. And um, I look at it as if we're doing anything possible to help Zach be successful, to help this organization win games. So, you know, as football coaches, that's our job is to my, myself and everyone in that room is to prepare the quarterback to give him the tools necessary to win on Sunday and then ultimately help this team win and, and start winning some football games here. So, you know, with Coach Cav, another veteran coach, I had so much information and another great guy that I was able to just soak things up from him, the way he taught, the, um, the way he viewed the position, just certain things that, you know, you can't get from anywhere else, but just going through it experience-wise with somebody. And then John Beck, who's, who's, a, who's a guy that's fundamentally going to look at each quarterback and know what's wrong with their throwing motion and can fix things by just seeing it on the field. And 
spending time with him and learning about the, the biomechanics and looking at a quarterback's feet or how to quickly fix something, but without wholesale changing something. I mean, I took, I took all those things that is, those are great opportunities for myself to, to grow as a coach and, and to grow within the quarterback position. WinBet is now live in New Jersey, and they're bringing the excitement of Win Las Vegas to online sports betting. Get in on all your favorite teams, players, and sports, from boosted parlays to live in-game odds on every major sport. They have what you need to win. Sign up today to receive a special offer, risk-free $1,000 sports bet. Download the WinBet app now or visit wynnbet.com to start winning. WinBet, an official sportsbook and gaming partner of the New York Jets. Offer subject to change. Terms and conditions at winbet.com must be 21 or older and present in New Jersey. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-270-7117. From your perspective, though, what changed for Zach pre-injury, then coming back post-injury? Because it's easy for us to say, we write it down, that, hey, listen, turnover streak. He started mm -hmm. uh, protecting the football. Five straight games, he ends the year. He's just making better decisions. But you know the game inside and out. What was different about him? It's um, it's a it's a rookie quarterback in the NFL, and that's that's the hardest position to play at this level. And and he was he was thrown in a fire game one as a starter playing playing that position up until he got hurt, and and within a within a game a season those weeks they, they just go it doesn't stop unless you have a bye week or you play a Thursday night game and you have two two days off so you just you just keep going and then you know when he did get hurt he was able to just sit back and reflect and go back through and watch those those games again and really think about what he was seeing and what he felt and. And what it meant to him in those certain situations and those moments. Also, while getting to watch, you know, Mike White, mm -hmm. Joe Flacco, Josh Johnson go out there and execute our our system, our scheme, and have some success doing it. And the reason why they're just just playing a position, playing each down, not force. You don't you don't have to make every single play. You just let the game come to you. So when he came back, he just had this this whole vision of the position on what he went through. He felt the speed of the game. He felt what it was like to play four quarters, sixty minutes, and the wear and tear of an NFL game. But he also had the tools to be successful and just play the position. So it was kind of like a, he called it his sophomore year. You right. know, he came back from, his, he played his freshman year and ended up getting hurt, which was unfortunate. But, and Zach being the guy he is, he took that as, a, as I'm, I'm going to get better from this. How? I, I, I go back and watch everything that I did and I learn from the guys that are playing right now. And it, it just never stops, which was, a, it was really cool to see from him to come back and just change the way he played the game. What did you tell him in January after that game in Buffalo? Because Mike LaFleur says it. I know you're going to echo those sentiments that he's a guy who doesn't get away. That's not natural mm -hmm. for him. It's exactly what we told him, to get away. Yeah. And take some time off and just do almost what you did when you, when you ended, up, ended up getting hurt. But first, just go collect your thoughts and just get, get yourself back to just back to reality. And then, then he started going through the film and started working on some things that he needed to work on with his footwork, some certain throws that he missed, and he was able to spend some time at, out wherever he was at, and he went all around to get with our receivers, which was awesome. That was a huge step for him from a leadership standpoint and just just building that that chemistry with all those guys. So he is a football junkie, but he you know he uh, he came back with a clear head and just ready to go. How does he challenge you inside the meeting room? Um, he he always wants his inf that he wants. He wants to know a lot, and we we've, we've learned over the last years is you know, there's there's useful information, and there's there's information you know that doesn't really matter. Just go play each play, play the position, and and do what we're asking you within the timing of the play within our scheme, and good things will happen. And I think he saw that with with Mike White and um, the Cincinnati game. You know, you're not you're just playing a game, and if if it's unfortunate that the number one receiver is not open, that's okay. Get your completion, and things start to happen because of that in the fourth quarter. And um, so we kind of just, our whole goal this whole lawsuit is to simplify our thoughts and then simplify our life. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> what You just talked about it, you had an example there, the Cincinnati game, but can you want too much information? Yes, and that's that's something I learned as a coach in year one. You know, you don't, that's our job is to have all that information and get the right play and play design and when and how and when and why. But we don't need to give you all of that. It's just, hey, this is probably the best case scenario, and this is the worst case scenario where you need to, you know, have a plan for. It. But other than that, you're just playing football. How different is he this spring? He's very different, and it's just a, it's another year. It's year two in the system, and especially for a rookie. And he's done. He did a great job because he was ready to play from a mentality standpoint. You know how hard it is when, a, <clears throat> especially a quarterback coming in and learning the verbiage, the system, being able to call plays, and then 
oh, that's the NFL pass rush. And then four quarters of that, the mental wear and tear. It's just, he's a different, he's a different guy. He's very confident in what we're asking him to do. He's very confident in our scheme because he knows it. And uh, that's a huge deal as, for a quarterback, for sure. What do you like most about working with Michael Fleur? Um, there's, there's a lot of things to like. I just appreciate his, his, his knowledge of the game, but I really appreciate how he communicates. And um, just sitting in those meetings, whether it's with the unit or the quarterbacks, and just hearing how he verbalizes his thoughts and how clear, concise messages are through, across the board to whoever. So each, each meeting, you're just hearing things. You're like, okay, and it's, everyone's on their toes, but they're locked in, and it's, it's meaningful messages. And that's, that's the one thing I appreciate from just being in those meetings. He was a passing game coordinator in San Francisco, of course, before coming over here with Sala from San Francisco. Uh, what's the dynamics like with you two? Um, we work closer together. We're, we're in, obviously in the quarterback meeting. So, you know, there's times that I have things to, to talk about with these guys. And then he has his going through the scheme, going through our reads. And we kind of – it's a really good mesh and gel with the, with the meeting room. It's just, I don't know, we, we were able to keep them on our toes because we're switching and, and who's presenting what and what tape are we looking at. And then um, just from a game planning standpoint this past year, you know, I was responsible for certain areas and just being able to go in his office – with confidence on why I like certain things because he is such a great communicator. It's not, it's not, I'm nervous to bring up a play and he doesn't like it. He has a way of just making you feel like this is, you're accepted. This is your job. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to win games. And if it's not right, we'll talk about it. Right. And that's the best thing about it. That's the best way I could put it. Like how, we could just talk about it. You know, how cool is it when you guys are in a game and you feel your quarterback in a flow and Lafleur at the same time in a flow because one thing that I think that he continued to mention later on in the year was, yeah, you guys are seeing more from us offensively, and you're saying I'm being more creative, but we just needed more plays. Need more plays, yeah. and you needed to be on schedule. Yeah, and that's 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 what Zach had learned too. It's you know we do we do have some schemes and some plays that we always want to get to, but you can't get to it if you're in not in second and long or you're you're already in passing mode down two scores. So that's that's our offense. We need to stay on schedule. We need to be able to run the football and get to our explosive opportunities, whether it's play pass or gadget plays. And um, there is, there's nothing like just, you know, on game day when you see the quarterback in his flow and then you know, and that's what you always try to visualize, you know, when you're a position coach is what is, what is the play caller going to call next? And you guys, if we're in sync and we know what's coming out of his mouth as far as the play and the timing and when and when we're attacking, it's, it's, it's really cool to watch unfold on Sundays. So Robert Sala is very happy with you. He said, this guy's got coordinator potential. He said that yesterday. Did uh, you, your te your phone blow up after that? Uh, no, a little bit. My my dad had texted me. Yeah. but Because uh, there's a Newsday article and my brother and my cousins. But I try not to pay too much attention to that stuff. And it, it's it's awesome to hear Coach Sala say that. And, and he has that belief. But I have to go prove it. And. Throughout my coaching career, you know, I, you have an idea of what you want to be, but everything that's happened up until this point is because I did a really good job with my job right now. And the second that I'd ever try to look forward to being something else that I'm not, that's not my title, then I'm, I'm slacking on what I should be doing. So I try to block out the noise in that aspect. I, I love that when people think of me in that light, but I'm just going to keep my head down and keep working. So he said he didn't want to blow up your spot, <laughs> but you had opportunities elsewhere. I did a little Google search, the Google today. It <laughs> seemed like a lot of people were linking your name to the University of Kentucky. You don't got to talk about the specific teams, colleges, whatnot. But I do want to ask you, why is this the right spot for you right now? It's because it's I believe in this organization. I believe in Coach Shala as a head coach and his message and, and what he's trying to accomplish here. And I believe in, in Mike LaFleur and, and, and I believe in Zach and this team. I just, I've always wanted to be able to, you know, leave some, some place better than, than when I showed up. And after last year, I know it was year one and, and Zach was a rookie myself. I was a young first year position coach in the NFL. And, and I'm, I'm not ready to leave without, you know, stamping that we've, we've done some special things here and I'm a Jets fan. I'm from Long Island. This is home <laughs> for me. So, just being close to family and, and all those factors, I just I, I want to I want to win some football games here. Do you and Zach talk about jumps some quarterbacks have made in between their rookie season to that second season? Um, not so much. You know, we, this this whole off season and, and since he's got here, it's just been solely focused on 
what we're trying to get better at from what we showed on tape last year and then how he can improve from quarterback standpoint, from decision making, from timing, from accuracy. So it's solely been based on just getting himself better. There is times that we do have, you know, examples and, you know, we have some time in the back end of a meeting. We'll watch some quarterback, cool quarterback clips on just things around the league that may, maybe didn't show up in his rookie year. But, hey, look, this is what happened to a certain player and this is how he handled it. Now, every play is a different play. You can't just bank that and say, I'm going to do that too. More This whole offseason is really just getting him mentally focused on just being being better at the position and being ready to roll. What do elite quarterbacks have in common? Um, they got that poise to them. They just have their, they, they're just great decision makers, no matter what the situation is, um, two minute or the first quarter of the game, they're, po they're poised and you can tell that by their feet and they just kind of play with timing and they play within the system and they're not forcing throws. They let the game come to them. And, and not a lot of people know that they see highlights on, yeah, on sports center ESPN of these, these wow throws whenever they are in the game, but they don't see all 25, 30 other throws where they're just underneath because the defense took it away. It's not every play can be an explosive, but what you do with your completions creates what happens later on in the game. WinBet is now live in New Jersey, and they're bringing the excitement of win Las Vegas to online sports betting. Get in on all your favorite teams, players, and sports, from boosted parlays to live in-game odds on every major sport. They have what you need to win. Sign up today to receive a special offer, risk-free $1,000 sports bet. Download the WinBet app now or visit wynnbet.com to start winning. WinBet, an official sportsbook and gaming partner of the New York Jets. Offer subject to change, terms and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in New Jersey. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-270-7117. What did you take away from that Denver experience? You were there, an offensive assistant for a couple of years, and I believe the Broncos. You went through <laughs> six quarterbacks, including Joe Flacco. Yeah, it was it was um, my first job in the NFL, and um, just to see how this whole thing worked and and what was really different about it was like you, you see the different schemes from the defensive standpoint unfold because that was my job was to break down. Um, the games from a defensive standpoint, and that was where I learned so much about football, just watching, I don't know, probably I broke down every game of the opponent that we played prior. So to just bank all those all those clips that I was watching of coverage and when defenses were attacking and why certain things happened, and then getting to work with Vic Fangio was um, was huge for me because I've never worked for a coach that viewed the game in that from that standpoint, from a statistical standpoint, self-scout, and how on it you have to be because certain coaches, they'll find things that, that you're not always aware of when you're when you're just in the moment of the season, just grinding and going through some certain things. He had everything pinpointed down. That's why he is a great defensive play caller, and that's why he, most of the time he's calling the right coverage because he's putting people on for what they've done. What do you like most about Flacco, and how does he help Wilson? Uh, Joe Joe's awesome because he, his wealth of knowledge from playing the game and for for this long at a high level, and he's he's an elite arm talent. He can put the ball wherever he wants. I knew that from Denver. But he's, uh, he's, he's in a good spot. He's been helping Zach out in the meeting room and whether it's on the field quickly, he's just, the information he's given Zach, Zach, Zach knows this and, and I'm sure he's appreciative, but it's, it's, it's so beneficial for him for at this point in his career to have a veteran like that that's won a Super Bowl, that's played this many football games, helping him out in a good spot in his career. How fun is the dynamic there? Flacco's older than you. Yeah. And, and obviously Zach's 22. Yeah. You know, so I got to imagine you guys have some interesting conversations sometimes. Yeah, yeah? It's, it's awesome. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we we kind of BS around a little bit in the quarterback meeting room at the end of the meeting or when we got a little bit of time. And it's just funny to see the age differences between Joe, myself, Zach, and the things that we talk about. And sometimes, you know, whether it's Zach or Joe, like, they're too far removed from that certain situation. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's cool. It's a good group of guys. We have a lot of fun. Um, they, they all mesh well together. It's a really good room. You're a Long Island kid. You broke a lot of Boomer Esiason's <laughs> records growing up in Long Island. Uh, can you talk about your experience and then how you wound up at UCF? Yeah, luckily, um, yeah, I did go to Boomer's High School, and and I know they I broke his records because they probably threw the ball five times a game. <laughs> but he was a he's a he's a Long Island legend. He's from my hometown. That's why I grew up a Jets fan and. Um, through the recruiting process, getting to meet him and him reaching out and trying to, you know, just help guide me through my career as a player and then more so as a coach now, he's been awesome. And um, what led me to Central Florida is Boomer's head coach, Sal Champy, at East Islip. I played for his son, Sal Champy Jr. And it's one of the most historic programs on Long Island. Yeah. He's 
was best friends, champ, the champion senior was best friends with the head coach at UCF. And I don't, I don't know if I had a decision, like I'm going to UCF because that's what the champions are telling me to do. And luckily they were able to, you know, get me out there for a visit. And I was lucky enough to get an offer and I saw the campus and ultimately I was like, yeah, I'm going to school. Yeah, here. Orlando, no Florida. <laughs> Listen, but you were following some pretty big footsteps, right? Dante Culpepper? Yeah. Yeah. Da Dante Culpepper played there. And um, I think he was the first true freshman to play. And then I ended up playing. Now, I didn't have the success he had. And it was I had a rough career, but I'd learned a lot. And that's kind of where I, I got the itch that I, I'm going to be a football coach, you know, from being injured and having to sit out and then watching Bortles come in and kind of helping him go through his career when I wasn't able to play. I knew right then and there, that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. South Scott is a quarterback. Me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> would make the right decisions, but um, never took too many chances. You know, when they were there, I was more so, you'd say like a check down Charlie. <laughs> I wasn't very accurate, but um, I could call a play, get us in the right play. And, you know, I had fun playing a position. Uh, but you were a thick dude back then, <laughs> too. Uh, most guys, if you look back at their college biographies, it doesn't say quarterback slash receiver. Yeah. Well, what's behind the story there? Um. I switched positions, let's see, after I had torn my ACL uh, three times in college, but the second time I switched positions because you know, we had two quarterbacks that were good players that were established, and I didn't see myself playing there. And, you know, coach had asked me to switch over to receiver because I can, you know, quarterback playing receiver, help get people lined up, not be the featured guy, but just trying to make this offense go and get ready, get out the line of scrimmage and be in the right play sometimes. So it was fun. It was a great experience. It was a different lens from viewing the game and, being able to see that meeting room and how those guys were taught and and go out there and try to execute because the speed of the game is totally different when you're a receiver. One from being conditioned to run that many routes and just get back every single play reset as opposed to a quarterback from the mental the mental focus needed every play where you've got to reset from that standpoint. So it was it was a good experience for me. Yeah, but they don't let everybody play receiver. What were you running the 40 in not approximately? Fast. Uh, not fast. Maybe 4-7, mid 4-7s. Not fast. Okay. And, and like I said, you were carrying on a little bit more weight than you yeah. do now. Yeah. What were you at? I was probably two fifteen, two twenty. Okay. Just, just still the quarterback weight, but um, I, at that at that point in my career, you know, I just I just wanted to help the team do whatever to win, and whether I play had to play special teams, and that's just I was a redshirt senior, just happy to be there with my the guys that came in with with that that recruiting class, and just. Just try and go out there and execute, even if it was ten plays, twelve plays a game. It was it was a good experience for me. But why did that different lens help you? You said as far as viewing the game. Yeah, just to hear how those guys are taught, because you know, and and the the different angles of the game in which they watch the film. You know, it's more so matchup when you are in a man to man situation for for receiver, and in a quarterback meeting room, we're looking at the whole the whole picture as far as conceptually, what are we trying to do? And receivers, you you're really just watching your technique. You're watching the DB's technique and. You know, how much you can separate and, and within the timing of the play. So it, it was it was fun to be in that room. And what do you think about the group uh, around him? Uh, I mean, surrounding your young quarterback now. You added Garrett Wilson in the offseason, Elijah Moore, five touchdowns in 11 games, Corey Davis back healthy, Braxton Berrios uh, returns as well. He resigns in the offseason. Denzel Mims, I can go down the list. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about the group? It's a, it's a good group. It's an explosive group. they got big play potential. Um, they all they all got rack ability, so run after the catch, and that's that's where Zach needs to understand. Like those guys, just get the football in their hands, and with whatever we're asking you to do, with whatever route they're running, if that guy is open, let's get it to him quickly so they can go make the explosive play. Yes, we're still going to go up top. We're going to have our creative plays and explosive opportunities, but it's a it's a great room for the explosive potential with the underneath throws, which you love to see as a quarterback. Uh, speaking of underneath throws, how about some of these security blankets in terms of the tight end position? You guys had C.J. Uzama, Tyler Conklin, a free agency. They combined for 110 catches last year, and then you come back, and you mentioned it before, you get Rucker in the draft. Yeah, and it, it, that's just from a scheme standpoint. You know, Defenses can't play certain coverages if we across the board have, have weapons, and they can't take away – the receivers and leave the tight end matched up with the linebacker. You know, Zach's got enough awareness now within the system to know that there's some access stuff that if you see a matchup you like, you're going to take it. And adding those weapons just 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 adds to our offense and and what we can do. When you put the period here at the end of the off season here in a couple of weeks, 
with the conclusion of veteran minicamp, which is mandatory right now. These are voluntary sessions here as we tape during OTAs. Where do you want to be at? Just want to be be able to go into training camp with hitting the ground running mentality. You know, you don't want to be able to just shut your brain off and come back and have to get these things reinstalled, whether it's a scheme, whether it's a formation, or whether it's a technique. So you want all these guys to just leave the, leave the field feeling really good about what they put out for the last four weeks or even more so two months with phase two and knowing what they got to do to get a little bit better and come back and train and get in shape and mentally ready to roll that we can hit the ground running as far as scheme wise. I'm jumping a little bit. I'm going to go back to your UCF days. You said you knew you wanted to be a coach. You started at the high school level. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who wants to coach? Just get your foot in the door with whatever um, program, organization, with whatever job it is. And um, I was lucky enough to just stay in the Orlando area because um, Central Florida did not have a graduate assistant spot open yet. So Coach O'Leary had told me, just hang out for six months, you know, go go do whatever. And I ended up working at uh, Blake Bortles' old high school and you know, getting to know uh, Coach Allen there. They gave me a job and I was working in the school and then was able to coach. And then come January, I was able to get on staff at UCF and from then from then on just stuck with it. But any young coach, you just want to get into the building, into the organization with whatever whatever you're doing. And then that's your, that's your interview. And if it's an internship, if it's an on-field, if it's a whatever, you have that moment you step in the building to impress whoever because you never know in, in, in today's day and age, there's there's guys, if you look at a room that you know, could be head coaches somewhere else, it could be coordinators and that's your interview process as you get going and you have to make an impression for however long you're there. Then you made an impression because then you went in the college ranks. Oh, one of those stops was Wagner, right? Yeah, Wagner College, yes. That was uh, after UCF was able to work with um, Coach Coach Hotailing at Wagner, was lucky enough to get a job there and then that's where I met Coach Scangarello who ended up working in San Francisco. But um, great experience, three three great years out on Staten Island. So a lot of good players. Greg Snott is one of them who's here and um, had a lot of fun during those three years. Uh, I've enjoyed this very much. Uh, we got to have you come back at some point. Uh, lastly, let's just, uh, final question would be Robert Sala. All the players says, say it really connects. You feel him when he talks. From your perspective, being a coach on his staff, what's it like working for him and with him? It's uh, it's amazing because he makes you look at a, a lot of different things from a different lens, whether it's you know, how deliberate we're trying to do things and how meaningful each rep is and each single individual, each meeting. What are we trying to accomplish? And that's how he looks at things. And, and can we be deliberate? Because the way he connects how we run our meetings and what you do an individual to how it shows up on game day, it's really impactful as a, as a coach to just look at that. And you're not just running drills you're doing things to get these players ready for Sunday. And and that's how you start to prepare yourself as a coach. You watch things around the league or whether it happened on Sundays, well, that could possibly happen. Let me let me have a drill set up. Let me have a, an awareness, just mentality ready for the for my position being the quarterbacks. Like I just I really appreciate how he views the game, how he connects it from everything that we do. Long Island's Rob Calabrese. Thanks for coming up to the studio. Appreciate it. Thank you.